coming up on this week's episode of Linux for Everyone. A discovery of the week that collects all of your games in one place and packs a few really cool surprises. Plus, another song from the source from a Slovenian duo. Also, right on schedule, Liam Daw from GamingOnLinux.com is back to tell us about one of his favorite Linux games. And I sit down with Christopher Scott, a Linux advocate inside Microsoft who is on a personal crusade for change in a company that many of us don't trust. Episode 10 starts right now. Abas, aš Barbara, ir mes klausomės Linux for Everyone Lietuvoje. Sveiki sugrįžę namo. Hey, welcome back, everybody. This is Linux for Everyone, a podcast about desktop Linux, open source software, and the community who is creating and enjoying it. My name is Jason Evangelo, and this last week I discovered that I'm a very quick study at Counter-Strike Go, but still cannot race a rally car to save my life. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but first, I want to give a very special thank you to Victoria from Lithuania for the welcome home tag that you heard during the theme song. As I always say, I am I am happy, more than happy, to have anyone from any country send me one of these. It's a very uh, simple format. So if I were doing it, it would be something like, hello, this is Jason, and we're listening to Linux for Everyone in Croatia. Welcome home. And of course, do that in your native language. That makes it so much more uh, authentic and just really, really cool. Okay, so before we get to the discovery of the week and my interview with Christopher Scott, I have to do some housekeeping because uh, it blows me away how much happens around this podcast and the community in the course of one week. So let's just let me just start at the top. Uh, Last week, we had our first official community game night where a bunch of us played Dirt Rally and Counter-Strike Go, and that is, of course, where I learned that uh, I cannot race a rally car to save my life, and that wasn't announced on the show ahead of time because it was sort of thrown together in just a couple days as uh, an experiment. It was was to see how we could pull it off, if we could pull it off, and um, honestly, a learning experience for me because... I spent about half of a day learning how to set up OBS and stream to YouTube from my Pop! OS installation. And aside from a few hiccups that were that were basically just uh, me not knowing what I was doing, it went off without a hitch, and it was a blast. We, uh, we streamed for about three hours, had about four or five other streamers with us. Uh, Big Daddy Linux showed up, System76 showed up bunch of members of the community also uh, showed up to play, and it was just so much fun. So to everyone who did uh, just kind of jump in there in what was, you know, basically spur of the moment, uh, thanks a lot. It was it was very memorable, and we're going to do it again. We're going to do it at least once a month, and I'll give you a heads up next time. I also want to give a big shout out to Aaron, who set up a Linux for Everyone Steam group, which made it a whole lot easier for us to all join together and do the matchmaking and stuff like that. Now, these future events will be streamed live on both YouTube and Twitch. So I'll have a link to the uh, Linux for Everyone YouTube and Twitch accounts in the show notes at, you know it, linuxforeveryone.fireside.fm. Speaking of YouTube, you can also get this show there, as you probably just figured out. Thanks to Michael from the Destination Linux Network. Uh, He wrote this really simple bash script that takes a 1080p episode album cover and an mp3 of the show and uses FFmpeg to generate this cool waveform and automatically transcode it into a video. And so he has streamlined that process so much, and I'm very, very grateful for that. And you guys get to reap the rewards. Uh, there's, there's more than 200 people already who've subscribed, so thank you so much. And I spent the weekend getting the entire back catalog of the show up there. 
and I'll work on stuff like timestamps and uh, things like that as we move forward. And the last little bit of housekeeping is an important one to me, and uh, I hope it's something that you guys will find a lot of value in as well. As you know by now, the Destination Linux Network is officially live, and this show is a part of it. But aside from just grouping all of the shows under this one umbrella, there's also a really awesome forum there. There are sub-forums, obviously for this show, but also for Destination Linux and This Week in Linux, DOS Geek, and the Ask Noah show and everything else that uh, comprises the Destination Linux network. And beyond that, there is a really useful support forum where people are already getting a lot of answers to some burning questions. So if you're on the Linux for Everyone Telegram or Discord and you can't find your answer there, definitely put it on this forum because there are already a few hundred people there who are really, really helpful. And yeah, I I view this community forum as just kind of an extension of the Linux for Everyone community because we are trying to cultivate the same kind of, you know, helpfulness and kindness and, and things that make this community so amazing. So if you want to check it out, it is at discourse.destinationlinux.network. And with that, let us get on to the discovery of the week. A lot of you have recommended this app called Game Hub, and I finally got around to installing and using it this week, and I wish I would not have waited. If you game at all on Linux, you might have your game collections sort of scattered across different services, right? Steam, Humble Bundle, or good old games, or even games you've installed directly. So what Game Hub is, is it's sort of a unified library for all of your games, So it allows you to view, download, install, run, and of course uninstall games from a bunch of different sources. And that can be Steam, Good Old Games, Humble Bundle, or locally installed games. And what makes this really neat is right when you fire it up, you simply log into those services and boom, your library is synced all in one place. But you can still separate it out by clicking on, you know, the the good old games tab, the humble bundle tab, the Steam tab. And then beyond that, you can categorize your games. So, you know, you can say, okay, these are backlogged games. These are games I've completed. These are all of my Final Fantasy games, uh, things like that. Now, if that was everything that Game Hub did, I would still be pretty happy. But it goes way above and beyond that. It supports multiple compatibility layers like Wine, Proton, DOSBox, RetroArch. You can install custom emulators. It also supports WineWrap, which is a, a set of pre-configured wrappers for supported games. And it, it just goes on and on. It's, it's pretty incredible, and it looks nice as well. It's, very, it's a very clean interface. You can choose, um, you can choose larger thumbnails or a list-type view. You can even truly personalize your game library by adding your own art for the game or custom icon, things like that. You can launch it from a terminal. It, it just has so many like power user options, but it also just looks really clean and it's really easy to use if you don't want to dig into any of that. So if you want to go to the source, GameHub is available at GitHub. And it's also installable from a PPA for all Ubuntu Linux distributions. There is a flat pack version of it, and it is in the AUR for Arch. So (laughs) definitely recommend checking this out. I am am just disappointed that I didn't uh, take your advice sooner. Hello, Linux for everyone listeners. It's Liam here again from Gaming on Linux to talk about another awesome Linux game that you need to go and check out. This time, I'm here to talk about Devader. Now, every so often, you come across a game and it sort of throws out a lot of what you knew about a genre. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have played Twin Stick Shoot'em Ups before, but I assure you, none of them are like Devader. Absolutely none of them. Now, unlike other Twin Stick Shooters, Devader has no levels. Okay, bit of a lie, it has one. Everything takes place in a single location. On this level, you're defending a core structure in the middle of the map, which is made up of lots of little structures, and you're going up against waves of completely bizarre enemies. It's basically a last stand against a ferocious, ever-changing foe. 
At times, the entire screen might be absolutely packed with various enemy designs. It's just mental. It has everything you could want. Local co-op support, an upgrade path with some absolutely ridiculous builds you can end up making. Explosions everywhere. And it's a game you can complete and then come back to it again and again. And it does feel quite different every time. The boss battles too. My God, the boss battles, they're absolute insanity. I nearly broke my mouse, my gamepad, everything. What's quite amusing about the Vader is that the developer openly admitted to not being very good at the artwork. So what they did is they took programmer art to the next level. They used simple forms with some complex programming and stuck it all together and it looks incredible. What they've basically done with the enemy design is just absolutely nuts. They're so wild and varied, it's hard to talk about them. You have to just experience it. Devader is a twin stick shooter like no other. It's a huge amount of fun. Go take a look. So my very special guest for this episode is Christopher Scott. He is a senior premier field engineer, open source at Microsoft. Chris, how are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. So you've been uh, you've been making some waves in the in the Linux community lately, and uh, that is actually what drew me to you because you've been on on, on sort of a self described personal crusade to affect some change both inside Microsoft and and the way that the community views Microsoft in terms of trust. So can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, what what is going on? What are you personally trying to do? Well, I've been part of the Linux community for many years, really. Just, I'd say, sort of on and off. Um, it's something I always kind of come back to every couple months or so, see what the state of Linux on the desktop is. So part of that is uh, you know, starting to engage the communities and listen to podcasts and, and just try to stay up on the news. And I hear a lot of, we'll call it vitriol, but, you know, just a, a poor standing of Microsoft in the Linux community's eyes. And I get a lot of that. You know, some of the things that are talked about that, you know, Microsoft puts out are Microsoft loves Linux, Microsoft loves open source, Microsoft runs on trust. And I thought, how do, how do we bridge that, right? Um, if, if we really love Linux and we want to build trust, how can we go about that? And so I started to think about, well, if I engage the community and try to find out what the community thinks, like, you know, what do people actually think? What would it take, right? What would it take to trust Microsoft? And, you know, not from the standpoint of necessarily changing what operating system you use or, you know, redoing all of your life and, Microsoft products. Um, that might be a hope one day, right? But you know, what, what would it take so that Microsoft doesn't look like the bad guy? Because I trust Microsoft. I trust the company I work for. And if I didn't, I wouldn't work here. So what can I do? I feel like that there's not anyone in a specific role that's actively doing that. We have cloud developer advocates and a lot of, a lot of things focused on People who are using open source and Azure, but what about everybody that's not? And uh, and I think that that part of the community is sort of left out. I've always been a, a proponent of the underdog, and you know, not to say that uh, everybody who doesn't use Windows is an is an underdog necessarily, but you know, just an underappreciated part of the technical community. I mean, and realistically, it reaches around the world. This is not just a U.S. centric problem or U.S. centric uh, targeted message, but how can I reach people who are in India or Israel or uh, Europe or anywhere else that I want to show that Microsoft is to be trusted? So, how long have you worked at Microsoft? It is now just over three and a half years. So, in in the context of uh, a number of my peers, not very long. In that time period, which is an admittedly short time period in the scheme of things, have you personally witnessed any any shift in, in Microsoft's culture as it relates to uh, the Linux and open source communities? I think that there's been a lot of a lot of change. Now, Satya took over as CEO, Satya Nadella, shortly before I started here. And I think there have been a lot of changes in the internal culture of Microsoft. And then that's where a lot of things came out around 
uh, Microsoft loving open source and Microsoft loving Linux. And, you know, these are words that Saatchi used and saying things like we are, you know, fully invested in open source. We're all in prior to joining Microsoft, you know, as somebody who's just a call, you know, I call myself a Linux hobbyist or enthusiast. What does that mean to me? Right. And, uh, and what do I see out of that? And I can see there are parts of Microsoft that are making a difference in those spaces. You know, uh, the example, not to, you know, say it's maybe overused, Visual Studio Code is, you know, this very large open source project that, that we create, right? And we own GitHub now, which is, you know, this very large repository of open source code. It always is targeted at that very large enterprise customer. And, you know, I, I think that there's there's still a miss in, in really targeting the general everyday person who has made a choice to not use Windows or has a preference to use something else. That brings up an interesting question. You've been engaging with, at least from my point of view, from what I see on my social media, mainly Linux users. And I'm, I'm curious in, in all of your interaction, whether that's on like the DLN forum or on Twitter or on Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, everywhere that you're trying to gather this data and make a change. What are people telling you in terms of like why they're not using Windows? Is there is there kind of a common thread? In many cases, yes. And, and honestly, my focus is certainly not just on Windows. You know, I, I want to have a more overarching goal and focus of this and that it's, you know, Microsoft as a whole, as, a, as the company of all the products that are used, right? And that's where... I started championing the, the OneDrive on Linux. It doesn't just target, you know, the Linux desktop users, but th this affects, you know, cloud. This is Office 365. Um, whether that you're a, a user at home who wants to sync your pictures and, and have those on your Linux desktop, or if you're in a in an organization, a company that uses OneDrive and you want to use Linux instead of Windows, and you want to be able to sync the files and have that same sort of experience. It's, it's about more than just that. But in terms of, you know, the Windows versus Linux thing, yeah, a lot of people say uh, a lot of the same things. It's about the telemetry and, you know, it's spying on me and privacy, um, the updates breaking the system, those kinds of things, the ads or apps that are pre-installed, you know, Candy Crush and all that kind of stuff. Those are the primary things that are, that are brought up every time. Okay. And I, I certainly understand that there are things that you cannot control. But let's talk, let's actually talk about the OneDrive situation, because this was really exciting. Tell us a bit about how this started. The goal is get a native, official OneDrive client on Linux, right? How did that all start? And, and how has it been progressing since then? I'll, I'll rewind roughly a year. Because at that time, I was supporting Microsoft Teams. I mentioned to you separately that you know I've had several different roles at Microsoft. They've all been premier field engineer roles. I joined Microsoft supporting SharePoint. Uh, I went moved into Microsoft Teams support and Skype for Business Online. And while I was doing that, I saw a need. Linux customers that we had, or those customers who had, you know, Linux developers couldn't fully invest in this product. They couldn't use this product because they had an underserved department or whole company that couldn't be met with Teams because we didn't have a client. We had a web experience, but it's not quite the same. It doesn't give you the same, or at least at the time, you know, desktop notifications, didn't have the same integration with the hardware, couldn't do screen sharing or video or, you know, different things like that that caused problems. And it was seeing that and then also seeing the internal community, we have actually a uh, Microsoft team uh, that's called Microsoft Loves Linux. And just people from around the company can join that team and, and talk about what they're doing with you know their systems or what kind of projects they're working on. And so I brought this up. I'm like, you know what? How many of you would like to use Teams on, you know, as an actual application and start really figuring out not only do we have interest internally, we have interest externally. How do I piece that together? Who do I need to talk to in order to make this happen? Who do I need to connect and say, hey, you're a developer of Linux software at Microsoft. Would you volunteer your time to help the product group build this if that were an option? And I got 
a number of hands raised. So I said, okay, let me take that. Let me find out who's the point of contact that I can talk to to start this process. And that's, that's really where it started. And it's, you know, it's taken time and effort and, you know, I just stay, I'm just passionate about it. And so that really, I think has helped kind of keep driving it because whenever things seem to almost fall away or really there's no updates, then I jump in. It's like, Hey, where are we at on this? You know, how do, what do we need to do to keep moving forward and make sure that this stays on, on top? And that's honestly not my day job. You know, that's not part of my job description at all. It's just something I, I can't not do. Your passion and persistence for this paid off, though, right? Right. With, with, with regards to Microsoft Teams on Linux, because just uh, a week or two ago, there was an update on the user voice page that said, hey, guess what? We're actively developing this. Yeah, that was actually on September 6th was when that was updated and finally said that we are working on it. And that's the first time where I felt like, yay, I can finally, you know, say something about it. What do you think was the tipping point? I I think it was, I, I look at myself and I, this is a skill that I've developed at Microsoft is I feel like I'm good at pestering people. And <laughs> I, it, it's, it's weird. I, I've, I've made a lot of friends because they're people that I found out that they know something that I want to know and I pester them until they tell me. And then we end up, continuing to have more discussions and and then sort of become friends in that way. Even though we're, you know, hundreds or more miles away from each other and may never get to actually see each other face to face, you know, I have some relationships from that. And it's, you know, I think being persistent is the key. And to my colleagues or to anyone else that um, that I get to interact with in regards to this, I, I share with them things like the article you posted and that, this interview is going to happen, you know, not because I want my name and my face to be, you know, praised. I don't, fame is not part of it. It's because I want them to see that if you're persistent and you're passionate, you can make change, especially new people and the younger people who come into this company or anywhere in technology. Man, I, I could not agree more with that. I mean, I, there there have been so many situations in my life where I have just kind of put it out into the world on, on whatever platform I had. This is something I want to do. And and gradually, that network and, and those connections come together. Being persistent and, and consistent is probably the best thing that you can do, no matter what, no matter what we're talking about, you know, put it out there, make it known that this is something you want, and you're going to get people that rally behind you. And um, it, it seems like that's what we're starting to see. I certainly hope so. Yes. And I mean, I, I know I didn't actually touch on your question about OneDrive, but having some success in this one area gives me the fuel I need to continue to push for more. In a selfish way, I look at what is it that I need to be to where I feel fully complete using Linux as my primary desktop at home and at work. Well, I need Teams for work, so let's make Teams happen. I need a, a OneDrive client so I can access my personal files and my corporate files at the same time on the same machine uh, without any issue. What else is needed? And that's where I got feedback from my peers. Um, you know, I have, there's developers that want a full fat Visual Studio on Linux. And of course, everybody wants Office on Linux. You know, with the Chromium-based Edge on Linux, all that stuff. And it's like, well. Why do I need to do one thing? You know, I wanted to champion user voice for OneDrive. Let's start there and see what can happen. Man, there there are so many branching questions that I have now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because, well, okay, to touch on your point about what do I need to have this complete Linux desktop that I love, that's something that I personally really enjoy about Linux and FOSS is there, and I, I apologize that I can't remember his name, but there's a developer who works on apps for the uh, elementary app center, the elementary OS mm -hmm. app center. One of the apps that he made was simply a result of that thing not existing on elementary OS. And so he made this really elegant app because he wanted it. You know, you can you can kind of expand that out into, into many different scenarios when it comes to uh, Linux desktops or even, you know, other alternative operating systems. I was going to ask you... Um, 
what Microsoft's business incentive was to get all of their apps on um, Linux, but I mean that's kind of a that's kind of an on the nose question, I suppose. In a in a way, I would say there's there's not much of one, and I think that's what makes it more appealing to me, anyway. Uh, the sentiment I've gotten from the community is that the community really wants to see a contribution to existing open source and uh, you know those kinds of things, and I think kind of doing something. I won't call it charity, but kind of like charity in a way, right? It, it's it's not going to contribute to a large increase in revenue. Uh, the Linux desktop usage is so low by comparison between, you know, because typically targeting Windows and Mac will cover almost everything. Linux desktop use is much, much lower. So doing something that benefits that part of the community is, from a financial standpoint, not terribly viable, I think, from, from Microsoft's perspective. Again, my opinion. I think one of the best sort of different ways to look at it than what I had thought came out of uh, a couple of people had posted this on, on the, the Twitter replies where, like, even if you didn't bring Office to Linux, work with the Wine developers, the code weavers and, and crossover and all that to help the tools that we have right now, either to where Office or other Windows applications will run on Linux properly, work with things like LibreOffice in order to make the file compatibility better. You know, those kinds of things will help bridge that trust gap to say, hey, we recognize that that you exist. We recognize that you're valuable and we want you to be able to make use of the same kind of tools and platforms, you know, that, that we make, but in the way that you want to use them. You know, I want to actually backtrack just a little bit because you were you were talking about this idea of of Microsoft being charitable, right? And and just giving back to the Linux and open source community. But, you know, I, I, I'm far from being a Microsoft apologist, but I feel like we see that happening in headlines every month. I mean, it, it's no it's no small feat to give up potentially billions of dollars of of patent revenue to open up 60,000 patents and join the Open Invention Network. We saw just last week, uh, Microsoft made their C++ standard library open source. And I, I'm seeing those headlines frequently. You know, now, sure, okay, they open sourced Windows Calculator. I mean, <laughs> many people, you know, who cares, really? But, but okay, it's a nice token gesture. But they have had a lot of huge gestures that are, that are potentially you know, something that affects their income directly. And and I think that, I don't know if people choose to ignore that or they just think that it's part of the embrace, extend, extinguish mentality, which, uh, which seems to be, you know, something that Microsoft cannot escape. Do you find yourself coming up against the embrace, extend, extinguish mentality frequently? I got some of that kind of response, but what I... I got most of in regards to that was more that people still see the first two E's, but aren't really seeing the last one, the extinguish. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not hesitant and watching carefully what's being done. Um, I think some of the examples you mentioned earlier about uh, the C, uh, C++ libraries being released and um, you know some of the other things that have been done have you know been for a probably a specific reason, but I think a lot of the say the community at large or you know the the non enterprise community doesn't see those things as trust builders. It's the things that will affect them in their day to day that are gonna that are gonna focus on building that trust and building that perspective of okay that embrace extend extinguish maybe really has gone away. I don't I don't hear that at all in the company. And I I know that there are thousands of people who are learning open source technologies. They're learning how to support our customers that use them, um, how to use them in their own jobs in order to make things better and, and you know just work better in general. But I don't see that, you know, that same mentality that, that was once there. I think a lot of that has changed, but I don't think that the public sees that. Um, even with these large announcements, it, it all comes back to, and I don't think this is selfish, but you know, for an individual user to say, but what does this mean to me? 
You know, it's interesting because there are very few mainstream outlets, media outlets, that will report on something like Microsoft opening up 60,000 patents. There are far fewer who would report on the fact that Microsoft open sourced their C++ standard library. And, you know, the, the average consumer doesn't ever see those headlines. They see headlines like, warning issued for the latest Windows update to 800 million Windows 10 users. That's what gets the clicks, and that's what people read. And so it seems like a, a fairly tall mountain to climb. I agree. And I, I will say this, that in, in the feedback that I got, I do feel like a lot of people tie their perspective of Microsoft specifically to Windows. I supported just about every application under Office 365. It saddens me if somebody is dismissive of all of that because Windows sucks or whatever it is that they say about it. Granted, the company is, is focused a lot on the enterprise business and seems to have different groups that focus on the consumer side of things. We have Xbox, of course, which you know is, is great. In, in its sense, and uh, the Surface team, while targeting business, sort of kind of targets consumer too, but there's there's a lot more that has to be done to target that individual consumer who happens to be opposed to Windows and, and give them a, a good experience to show them that, hey, you know, Microsoft has something for you too. I figure at this point, I should say for the record, I do not distrust Microsoft. I simply don't like Windows. I have an Xbox. I had the original Xbox. I have the Xbox 360. I bought the first Surface Pro when it came out. I bought a Zune. You know, my, <laughs> I love, I love, I, I truly love the hardware that Microsoft makes. I used Office 365 for several years. Um, there's, there's so much in that ecosystem. But yeah, Windows is frequently what we, what we most associate Microsoft with. And so what, I mean, what, what do you do in your messaging? You know, how are you, how can you start to rebuild that trust by sort of talking to people about all these other positive points? For me, it, this is a, a personal goal. Um, just to, what I'm about to say is it, personal to me, to my family, as a, as a human being, is to, is to be a better listener. And so my first real task is to try to listen. Right? What is it that we can do? What, what can Microsoft do? And I've compiled a list of a number of different things that people have said. And the feedback that was specific to Windows 10, I sent that over to somebody on the Windows 10 side. Maybe there's something I could try to get involved in, but honestly, that's not my focus because I'm not, I hope that Windows development always gets better. But just like I hope when Linux development always gets better, things things have to, to get better. And I think that we see, or we should see, especially over the past couple of years, um, I've just seen anecdotally on the internet lots of gamers who have moved from Windows to Linux because the gaming platform works. You know, Steam with Proton, uh, Lutris, things like that um, just have, have just exploded in popularity because they actually work now. They, I mean, I've tried for years <laughs> to play the games I wanted to play, and oftentimes that's what made me always go back to Windows was because I would spend the time and, I, you know, load, load up, you know, Ubuntu, I started, I found out about Ubuntu probably around version 6. You know, just like, load it up. All right, this is great. I got wobbly windows, and I can write on the screen with fire. But can I run my game? I have to I have to jump in here since you're talking about the gaming front, and I'm a gamer. It's a shame, really, how we associate blame for certain things, right? You know, Microsoft made the decision to take two of their flagship game franchises, Halo and Gears of War, and say, hey, okay, fine. These aren't exclusive to the Microsoft Store anymore. We're going to put them on Steam, right? And the world rejoiced. I rejoiced. But then we found out that both of these titles use Easy Anti-Cheat. But Easy Anti-Cheat is owned by Epic. Epic Games is, is the thorn in our side, not Microsoft. But I see so much hate towards Microsoft for the fact that these games aren't going to work on Steam Proton. I just I just wanted to call that out. I'm not, you know, I'm not a Microsoft fanboy, but I think that we have to we have to not ignore the cool things 
that are happening while trying to blow up the bad things. That's true. I mean, it's in, in this particular example, you know, we could take back and think, you know, are there other anti-cheat solutions that could have been used that are, you know, widely supported that could have been implemented in these products um, instead of easy anti-cheat? I just wanted to call that out because that was not an example of Microsoft saying, ha ha ha, these aren't going to run on Linux, suckers. Well, I mean, I can I can think of it like this. You know, it's like, uh, you know, there's enough people who say, I'm not going to use the Microsoft Store to get these games, but I would buy it if it were on a different store, right? The store I use, Steam, in this example. But I think still that's intentionally targeting the Windows market and since Easy anti cheat works there, it works fine, right? That's a good a good option. But not being necessarily mindful that there are others. And I think it's long debated the chicken or the egg, right? It's do you target Linux when there's relatively little desktop share, hoping that by you targeting that community that you gain more traction, that that community grows, or do you wait until that community grows before you target it? And I think many companies fall into that second category. Well, once there's significant market share, then we'll start paying attention. I get that from a monetary perspective, financial perspective, many of them. And you did the interview with uh, Bearded, Giant, Bearded Giant Games, and uh, you know he targets Linux, making a good a good amount of money from those Linux people who want to buy the games on their own platform. You know, so so there's counter arguments, right? It's easier to target the 95%. And ignore the five percent or whatever the metrics are at the time, then try to spend any any additional time, energy, effort on including the five percent. My mission here is is to try to help change that where I can. I am a very small fish in a very large ocean of a company, and if I can start to initiate a little bit of change in the right direction, I hope that this gets picked up by someone higher up the food chain that this can be broadened in, a, in an actual real initiative to really invest in and look at this community and show that everyone, you know, regardless of platform, has has a voice, that they matter. Uh, I think it, it goes back to company culture and the way that things have changed a lot internally in order to support this. And it's from a technical standpoint and from a financial standpoint, it's a little different, but I think it, it resonates the same with me. Let me ask you this. If you had to pick two things that uh, that really resonated with you that have come from the community saying this is what we want most from Microsoft to gain our trust or this is what we want most for Microsoft to change. I boil that down to one because if so, the overarching feeling I get out of this is that the consumers want to be valued as customers. And many of them would be customers if they felt that that they were valued. And right now, that's not the case. It still very much feels like at that level of, of consumer, the Linux user, the person who chooses Linux as their desktop, that Microsoft says, I don't care about you, and I don't care if you're consuming our services, if you're willing to pay us money, doesn't matter. You're not big enough to to bother with. And I, I hope I don't ruffle any feathers with that. It's, you know, just just the sentiment I get out of it. The overarching thing is is this, that value me and I will in turn trust you. And I think that's it's it's about relationship in that case. In your interactions with the community, and I've seen this and I'm sure you've seen this, it strikes me as interesting that so many people place value on these Microsoft products. Right. They're not, these people aren't saying, well, I'm just going to use LibreOffice or I'm just going to use NextCloud. There's, there's a substantial amount of people who are saying, yes, I want OneDrive. Yes, I want Office 365. That, I, I totally agree. There have been a lot more support for if this existed for my platform, I would use it. I would pay money to use this service if only I could. I know that some people are going to be against paying for an office suite, you know, especially a perpetual model where you have to pay yearly for it. My perspective is different. Office 365 for home users offers 
you know, five accounts with a terabyte of storage in the cloud each, and along with Office 365 for full Office suite access to their machines and their, their mobiles. It's great. But why can't I get that on, you know, the platform I want to use, right? Um, there's so much more that's, that's added to that. Um, and I think that the Microsoft keeps adding more features to that in order to make that even more valuable for, you know, $100 a year. Some people can't afford that, but, you know, for uh, many people that this would target, it, you know, that's not that big a deal when you look at the cost of Amazon Prime or, you know, maybe some other storage solution you're paying for in the cloud. And to be fair, uh, so many people say the same thing about Adobe products, right? Mm -hmm. I would switch to Linux if Adobe Creative Cloud was on Linux. It's the fact that more and more people use apps and the operating system is just kind of what enables those apps to be used. A lot of people, I would argue a lot of people don't even care what the operating system is. And the people who do care will make the switch for whatever personal reasons they have. You know, I made the switch to Linux because I liked the idea of less telemetry and more customization and smoother updates to my operating system. And, yeah. it, and it felt like, it felt like this is actually my, my personal computer is, is actually mine again. But you know what? I still, I still want to use commercial products like Bitwig, like Premiere Pro, but I want to do it on Linux because of my personal choices. And that might, and that might ruffle a few feathers as well, but. <laughs> yeah. And there will always be advocates on like, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, right? But I, I do think most people fall in the middle. If I were making something, I look at it like this. What I want people using uh, a software or operating system, whatever it was, begrudgingly and hating it, but they had to use it because it was the only thing that they could do this one thing on. Or would I want customers that were happy? You know, I, it always comes back to numbers too, right? You know, the, the number of people in this audience compared to the people who just use Windows just because it's there, it's already on the computer when they buy it, it's going to be much smaller. I mentioned this before. If you're passionate about something, make your voice heard. No company is going to pay attention to somebody who's just going to troll and who's just going to spit out vitriol and say a lot of negative things without having a foundation of, of solid points and solid reasoning as to you know what it is that they're after. You know, on that note... If you want to speak really honestly about it, how has your interaction been with the Linux community since you kind of asked that big question? What do you not trust about Microsoft and how can we gain back that trust? So far, so good. I, I have been worried at times about sort of outing myself as working for Microsoft and, and being perceived as a mole or whatever, you know, coming into a Linux community. Uh, but honestly, I've, I've had a lot more positive response than I expected and, and really no Nobody's really challenged, you know, my uh, my take on it. I've tried to be very, very upfront and public about why I asked the questions I asked and what it is that I'm trying to do, because I want to diffuse that. At the end of the day, I'm not to overuse it. I'm just a small fish. I'm I'm essentially just an employee who has a passion for the same uh, foundational desktop that that you do. Whether we like the same DE or not, it doesn't matter. You know, if we well, okay, okay. Oh no, what is oh, what no. is? Oh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> you oh, opened the man, door. I almost got through the interview <laughs> without the that. Door. Crap. What desktop environment do you use, Chris? GNOME. All right, that's that's what I use on Pop OS. So I ha yeah, I'm on Pop OS as well. On this machine, my laptop is on Ubuntu, which has GNOME, uh, and I did just use two different pronunciations of it. I'm not worried about that. Um, <laughs> I like. XFCE 4.14 is great, um, and and I really like what they've done with it because I've I've heard you say it before, and I've seen it myself that it always looks old and outdated and kind of like Windows 95 ish is the way I've always seen yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But I'll tell you this, not that you don't know, but Manjaro, I love Manjaro, and and I I'm a big fan of rolling release because I'm a nerd for the latest and greatest packages and updates and kernels and all that stuff. I love it. Um, just for the work that I'm doing and the testing that I'm doing, I need a, a, a dev-based system. So Pop works for me. It gives me what I what I need most uh, to be able to do stuff. But whenever I could go to 
Manjaro, I probably would again. Uh, but I tried out that with uh, XFC 4.14. It's actually on my Surface Pro 3, um, which is I mean, it's just nice. Um, I've tried KDE many times in the past, and I just... It's like over, it just kind of like blows my mind how much change you can make to it. And I can never settle in on a look that I like. So I, I get wrapped up in changing so much stuff that I, I don't actually ever do anything with it. It's like I fiddle with it until it's broken. That is exactly why I can't use KDE. Because there's too much customization. And I'm sure that's that's like catnip for a lot of people. And that's just pure gold. But I will spend an hour or two out of each day just going, oh. Oh man! Oh, I I gotta change this. I gotta tweak this. I gotta I gotta customize this, and I just don't have the time. And so, you know, GNOME just I add a few extensions like dash to dock and no annoyance and things like that. And after that, it just it just gets out of the way and lets me work. But personally, I know we're going way off topic here, but screw it. I would love to see a System seventy six interpretation of Pop OS with XFCE. I would use that in a heartbeat, I think, because I really do prefer XFCE when it comes to just, you know, especially on laptops, battery life and responsiveness. I will say this system uh, that I'm running now is what I recently built, and I built it straight with Linux from the get-go, and I initially put Manjaro XFCE on it, and I was on the testing branch, so that way I could get 4.14, and it was, I was surprised how snappy it was. I feel like in some ways it was a lack of animations, that you get so the transition and some things was seemed faster because there was no animation of it but i will say that there are some you know sort of lags or whatever in, in gnome and you know i would like to see an updated gnome uh, so i will update to 1910 when that's available it's pretty remarkable the difference between for example ubuntu 1810 with gnome and ubuntu 1904 with GNOME. I actually did some benchmarks that that showed there was not only a decrease in memory resource required, but also an increase in performance. And and so there, you know, from I mean from a six that's a six month period, right? And so yeah, I, I can't wait to see what they do with like nineteen ten. At this point, as as much as any other ones improve, I, I always feel like I'm coming back home to GNOME. I've I've always been a big fan of Fedora. Because I mentioned I like rolling release. I like I like fast. But Fedora gave me that. When I would tinker and I would play with stuff, uh, Fedora was updated more than Ubuntu was. Ultimately, kind of what throws me a little bit is the RPM-based instead of uh, deb-based, at least right now. Um, you know, I do like the inclusion of flat packs and snaps. I love those. Well, Chris, now that I've gotten you super comfortable with that big long tangent, and and we've bonded over our our you know commonalities <laughs> with Linux distributions, I have to ask you this question: Do you think at some point Microsoft might develop their own Linux distribution? Well, I can only speak from you know my my own personal opinion here, but I mean we have the Azure Sphere OS, which I don't think anybody really counts as anything useful except for uh, people that are using it in an enterprise stance. But I won't say it's not a possibility. I mean, anything is possible, right? But I, I just don't think it's all that probable. We're very heavily tied to Windows and where it is and the legacy of development that's, you know, the underpinnings of back in the NT days. So I just don't see how it, how that would happen. I think a lot of people a lot of people point to the fact that you know WSL that's Windows subsystem for Linux and and WSL2 and all these other pieces like putting XFAT into well I should say opening up XFAT so that it can it can be included natively in the Linux kernel. Some people are speculating that Microsoft is very slowly getting around to building their own Linux distribution. But I guess let me let me twist that question a bit. If Microsoft developed their own Linux distribution, what would that look like for you? What would you want out of that? Well, I think the same thing would apply to that as applies to people who just want to rip out the kernel and replace it with a Linux one, or really what people in the community want today is some, some really full compatibility with Microsoft Office applications. That's, that's minimum. And I think that that is so far off of what Microsoft is prepared to do and able to support 
it doesn't seem realistic to me that it could be done because there'd be no way to put out a Microsoft Linux and it not fully support Office and it not be you know fully compatible with all of the other products that we have, games and everything, right? And this, I mean, this goes back if I if I spin it back to my own mission to say this is what I'm trying to get to. I, I think you know some people have asked for some very large leaps like this, and mm-hmm. I I try to approach it more pragmatically and say it's going to take baby steps but let's start making the baby steps today we don't have to say well this is such a big undertaking let's not even talk about it until tomorrow and i'm trying to say let's talk about it today all right so if people want to get behind you on this how can they help you how can they how can how can they get involved that's what i ask every every developer who comes on the show how can the community get involved in helping you Currently, the only path I have for the public to help is via user voice. In a way, I kind of hate to say it because I've heard so many. I've heard so many people go every time I say it. But but we've seen that it works, right? We have seen that it works. It certainly helps a lot. I think you know the user voice for for Teams uh, on Linux was 2,000 a year ago, give or take. You know, and that has grown a lot over. You know, it's now like almost 10,000. Um, So that helps a ton so that the product group understands what the actual demand is for this. If they don't have that, they don't know what to go off of. You know, they can listen to our customers, but if the customers they're talking to don't have anyone that use Linux, then that voice is not heard. That voice doesn't exist there. So if you're in the public, you know, follow my Twitter account, C-H-S-C-O-T-T underscore M-S-F-T. All of my links for the user voice posts are there. You can go vote on them. You get three votes in many of the cases. You get three votes per time that you vote. Um, some of them, like Visual Studio, you only get one vote. You know, comment on there too. Don't just vote. Voting's great, but add comments. Why would this matter to you? Why is this important to you? Um, you know, if you're part of a business, a, a company, and you have other people who are like-minded, get them to vote too. We have to remember that an opinion or perspective that we have may be completely new to someone else who is, you know, part of the decision making process there. And I will rarely, I will almost never bring politics into the show, but this is not unlike voting. You know, so many people get discouraged because they feel like my vote doesn't matter. I'm just a drop in the bucket. I'm a speck of sand. You know, I'm not going to make a difference. But. There are so many cases, you know, inside of Microsoft and outside for with other companies where those user voice votes have made a tangible difference. Your one, two or three votes, whatever the user voice post is, are important. And you don't certainly have to vote on the things that I've championed. Um, There are lots of other things, lots of other um, initiatives that people brought up that you can vote on too or you know create your own if one doesn't exist if there's a specific feature of a product you want made or uh, something that doesn't work correctly whatever it is you know let the product group know that this is a need that brings up an interesting question how many microsoft apps right now are on user voice that the community is uh, trying to get a, a linux version made I can list the ones that that I'm currently trying to be involved in, and that is the OneDrive on Linux, which is doing very well. Um, In about a week and a half, we've taken that one from three votes to 1,474 at this moment. Um, So I'm excited for that. I've got Visual Studio, the full fat Visual Studio on Linux, which needs a lot more support. The Chromium-based Edge. And then also just in general, Office 365 or the you know the Office Suite. I have a link for that one as well. I'm sure there are other applications that people would like to see on Linux. These are just the ones that I you know picked off the top of the pile as what was either the community had said I need this. If you had this, it would help build trust with Microsoft. Or if you had this, I could do my work. And if I can be successful in one application, maybe I can be successful here and getting some traction. And if that happens, we just keep going. And I know this is this is totally a, a bit of a sidebar and a bit of a stretch. Internally, the Microsoft culture is all about diversity and inclusion. And there's probably a lot of public stuff about that too. But if I think about it in those terms, 
diversity and inclusion. Your voice is the diversity we need. Your reasons, your thoughts, your ideas, that's the diversity we need, not just the people within Microsoft. What do they think about Linux support? No, we need the community to provide that voice. And then the inclusion is not excluding a, a particular desktop OS just because it's a particular desktop OS, right? I mean, there are countries whose governments have moved off of Windows. So now they're, you know, yes. are we just going to say, mm -hmm. you guys don't matter to us? That's a whole country. From a business point of view, you know, Microsoft is a business and and a business with shareholders uh, and a public, you know, being a, a publicly traded company, they have an obligation to make money. And, you know, we've all seen that Microsoft and, and a lot of other companies are slowly shifting into a software as a service. That one country switches to Linux, but then another country does and another country does. It's certainly beneficial for Microsoft and its shareholders to have their software and their services everywhere. No doubt, because it's about cloud. I mean, we're a cloud-first, cloud-focused company. You know, why should you be limited from using particular software in order to support and maintain your own users on, you know, on a, on a particular platform? You know, I think Office 365, you, know, you can't run your Office applications, you know, many of the stuff, the different things don't work correctly if you're on Linux, right? Because there's so many places where Linux is, is the de facto. Why can't we reach those people and, and help them get into, you know, Microsoft services? Because I think that these are trustworthy services. Why can't why can't others see that? I guess is kind of kind of my point, and that's where the question again you know comes from is I trust the company, why don't you? And then by trying to listen to that, what can I do to make that different? Because I'm not seeing that kind of change, so I want to you know be the driver for that kind of change. Before we say goodbye, I just I have to applaud you on what you're doing because I know that this kind of personal mission cannot be easy. And I know that it certainly has some challenges and, uh, you know, that you're, you're taking a lot of your free time to, to engage the community and try to shift this, this viewpoint that a lot of people have about Microsoft. Well, I appreciate that. It's honestly, it's, it's fun for me. It, you know, it's, it's something that I'm passionate about. So it, I just, I get jazzed up to be able to talk about it and, uh, and, and really feel like I'm, I'm making some sort of difference, you know, like I said, you know, just a small piece of the puzzle, uh, but if, if I can get the, the gears turning in the right way uh, and get people, say, in the community to even start thinking about what else is Microsoft doing outside of Windows and what can I do to kind of help with this process. You know, it's, it's very early days today, but I expect and hope that there's going to be change tomorrow. Well, it is almost time to say goodbye again, but first, I owe you another song from The Source, and this one hails from Slovenia. Musicians Maja Delak and Luka Princic formed a duo called Wanda and Nova Deviator, and it can best be described as hypnotic, melodic, sci-fi electronica? I think that would that would be doing it justice, actually. And once you hear it, you'll understand. It just has this really engaging buildup and flow to it. And then when the vocals kick in, it's just it's just hypnotic and it just kind of pulls you in. I really, really enjoy it. And again, this this whole songs from the source segment has has made me look outside of my rock and roll walls a little bit. And I'm really starting to get into some of this music that I wouldn't have considered before. I'll see you soon for episode 11, and as always, take care, and take care of each other. Hi, my name is Luka Perincic, and I'm a musician, sound designer, and a media artist. And I'm also a huge fan of Linux and free Libra open source software, and I'm using, using it for more than 15 years. Uh, for example, I designed sounds and various uh, media installations in Pure Data, which is Libre graphical programming language for sound and multimedia. Uh, but lately, I'm uh, a lot into Super Collider, which is another programming language for sound. I also run a Creative Commons net label called Kamizdat, which features local Slovenian talent and covers like a wide specter of genres of electronic and electroacoustic music. So these days, my workflow includes um, a digital audio workstation called Renoise, 
which is a music tracker. Uh, it features a vertical timeline and very powerful sampling engine. I make my own sounds in Super Collider and uh, I also use Ardour where I usually record vocal recordings and I use a lot of uh, plugins which are called CALF plugins. And of course the whole thing glues together the, the known jack low latency audio server. The track that you're gonna uh, about to hear is called Levitation and it comes from a 2015 album uh, called ARP339 made under the alias Wanda and Nova Deviator, which is the alias for a duo uh, with my partner. But actually, this is my favorite track from this album. I think I really like the production. I think the production went really quite far as I can go. Uh, it has a right amount of variation in structure, enough details and uh, enough dynamics. There's a good amount of layering. It's still danceable. And it even has lyrics and vocal by Wanda. I hope you enjoy.
Breathe.